I'd like to start off with who we are. Um, you in the back row, blue shirt. Who are you? Ken. Front row, pale blue shirt. Who are you? I'm Sergio. Sergio. Ken Schmidt. Uh, black shirt right in the middle. Who are you? John How do we identify ourselves? Names. Names. It's actually great. Uh, well, okay, maybe, maybe if we all had RFIDs or something deeply embedded with globally unique identifiers, that would simplify things for a lot of us from a Geek League perspective. But it is kind of handy that across cultures, with a few exceptions, human beings have names and principally identify themselves by whatever names means in their particular culture, language, and society. I'm with Basis Technology. We're a software vendor partnered with Lucidworks. We uh, concentrate on text analytics, and that involves uh, quite a stack of different capabilities that I'm not gonna talk about. There's one part in the middle of the stack, though, that the title says I am gonna talk about. Mike's gonna help me, and that is names. Of all the text, probably the most valuable text of all tends to be human names because it ties to these human beings. And uh, sometimes facetiously I'll say it's really just a niche capability, a niche problem. Only matters if you deal with people. So let's start with some motivation. We're gonna cover, this being DC, both government mission cases and commercial business cases. I'm gonna start with a mission case that's quite personal to us at Basis Technology. We're headquartered in Cambridge, Massachusetts, specifically out near the Alawife metro stop. Two brothers, Americans, went to Linge, Ringe Latin High School about two miles away from our headquarters, and together they perpetrated the Boston bombing. The elder of the two brothers, Tamerlane Sarnayev, was watch-listed, first by the FBI when he left the country, then by the CIA when he returned. He was on watch lists both times. And name-based challenging, checking, recognition failed both times for opposite reasons as it happens. On his exit from the country, he was watch listed by the FBI based upon a cable message from the Russian FSB, actually the descendant of the old KGB. And the FSB had told the FBI that Tamerlane Tsarnaev and his brother were being radicalized back in uh, their Chechen homeland and in adjacent Dagestan. So as Tamerlane Tsarnaev left Logan Airport, he actually matched the watch list. Problem is, false positives. So did over 200 other people. There wasn't time to talk to them all. There was nothing that distinguished him as the one that should be spoken with and we missed the opportunity to talk to him and intercept him as he was leaving the United States. That FBI watch list expired. Different cable from the FSB while he's in Russia saying, hey, this guy's being radicalized more. This time it's the CIA that watch lists him. And this time they do it with a star, a gold star, saying detain this person, call the watch officer immediately. Had he been detained on his return, that bombing would never have happened. Not sure if he'd been challenged when he was leaving, would it depend what he said. Definitely would have nailed him on the return. As foul luck would have it though, the software then in use for name matching missed. It was based upon, the congressional report calls it a misspelling, but it's not. It's just a spelling variation. How do you spell Sarnayev? Which of the 26 letters do you use to spell Sarnayev? Well, it's actually mostly none of them, except the ones that happen to have some commonality with the Greek alphabet from which the Russian Cyrillic alphabet was derived. There is no one right way to transliterate from the Cyrillic alphabet to the Latin alphabet that we're all familiar with. So these are really just variations. There are some conventions, and it's safe to say, having worked with government intelligence analysts, there are a couple of different conventions and nobody ever uses either one of them consistently. The same analyst on the same day may spell one of these names differently. 
So this is unfortunately a perfect storm at the cost of uh, uh, dozens of uh, lives and permanent maimings of both the false positive and the false negative problem. So classical precision relevance trade-off. How do you ensure 100% precision? This is true of any, any type of retrieval, any type of search. How do you get 100% precision? Perfect. Yeah. Don't return any results. You didn't return anything wrong. How do, okay, with that as a clue, how do you get 100% recall? Return everything. Simple problem. Perfect mathematical example of a degenerate problem uh, with a vacuous answer. Of course, it's getting a good balance between the two. And both of them are required here with an example, a government example, of counterterrorism. But counterterrorism simply can, be, can also be accomplished quite easily. I guarantee you we could eliminate terrorism 100% by not ever letting anybody into the country and not ever letting anybody out of their house. Might have an increase in domestic violence, but we'd have no terrorism. So again, another degenerate case. But although I'm using a hyperbolic example there, the real thing happens as well. There's a balance that we're striking in policy between counterterrorism and civil liberties, just as we in information retrieval strike a balance between precision and recall. So here uh, some of oh, uh, just, just uh, going forward, uh, I've, I've you know, kind of uh, stolen my thunder. The solution was what we're going to talk about. We're going to go into great detail on that. I, I won't uh, address the mission case other than saying the immediate approach was to turn up the fuzzy match. Uh, what, what was the effect of turning up the fuzzy match on uh, recall? Do you think it helped? It helped. What about precision? So this is why we were, what we were brought in and what we're going to talk about was brought in. Uh, to give a volume on this, and we'll give several volumes because we're talking about stream processing here as well. Uh, it's now working at 260,000 queries per hour uh, during peak hours of air travel. Uh, you're going through this system and being matched against names 72, 24, and two hours prior to your departure. Okay, so to continue with my theme, we've got this problem with false positives impinging on civil liberties. And that's happened to very embarrassing effect. Civil rights legend John Lewis had government has said, said what, some sort of correlation with some sort of entry in one of the watch lists. He was detained. Congressman now. If there's one thing worse than a congressman, it's a senator. Ted Kennedy was detained due to a match on a watch list. The Customs Border Protection detain person uh, detaining him had to know it was a false positive, but this was procedure. Sorry, Senator. I know this is going to create some terrible press for us, but I've got to detain you. And if you're really into aging child actors, so is David Nelson. Who knows what the matches are? The government generally doesn't say. They do have a redress process that hopefully at least prevents repetition of this. OK, who here in this new room knew that Rihanna was a terrorist? Not only is she a terrorist, they caught her. <laughs> Yet another false positive causing an impingement on civil rights. So this is the balance at the mission level. Uh, you know, since I'm, I'm the guy wearing, well, it's not a suit exactly, but anyway, the jacket. I'm going to take this more from the business level down. Mike's going to do it from the technical level up. This is the conundrum that we've got to face of balancing false positives, false negatives, precision recall, counterterrorism, and civil liberties. There's no 100% right answer. The key is to get as much accuracy as you can. So with that as mission motivation, we'll go one level down. Uh, we talked about how we identify as names. Almost all cultures identify as names. Uh, but moving them across languages, transliterating them, we gave the example of Tamerlane Sarnayev. How about Muhammad? How many ways are there to spell the name Muhammad? Anybody? There's one way, and it's in Arabic. Unfortunately, most of our systems don't deal in Arabic, and therefore we get a half dozen transliterations into the Latin alphabet alone, not to mention how Muhammad could be transliterated into Chinese phonetics, Japanese phonetics, 
or offhand, I don't even know what it looks like in Cyrillic. So across all of these alphabets, cultures, languages, names are undergoing these changes. Sometimes, even within a language, there are phonetic variations. I talked about the transliteration problem. What about nicknames? Anybody here know the proper name for Chewy? Someone's name is Chewy. What is their given name? Jesus. Jesus. Uh, along the same lines, um, you've probably heard of uh, Eduardo Guevara. What's the nickname for Eduardo? J. So every language, if you haven't dealt with Spanish uh, first names, you're probably not used to that. But every language has things as non-obvious as Billy for William, Betty for Elizabeth, etc. We've also got initialisms things added to names that aren't really names, they're actually honorifics and titles. We've got a fielding problem. How many fields are in a name database? US, it's usually three, because that's our social convention. I've, had, I've got a birth defect. I was born without a middle name. I've got two. Uh, most South Americans use their mother's maiden name, the matronymic, as a fourth name. And you never really know where that part, that's as much a part of their name as your middle names are for your names here in the US. You never know what field that's going to end up with. If it'll have a space in it, it'll be truncated. If it will be appended, uh, all of those happen. Now we add hyphenation, other types of punctuation. Uh, again, a database fielding problem, even within a fairly conventional, in this case, Dutch origin name in the US, Van Dyke. Is Van a middle name, or is it part of the last name? How many names does a person have? Many Afghanis only have one. Matter of fact, for the first six months or so of their life, they don't have any name. They have zero. And they get one name, and that's plenty. What field does that go in? Your guess is as good as mine. Tamils commonly may have up to a dozen names. They'll take some sequences of those names that are common and abbreviate them with an acronym. So all of this variation has to go into the problem where we're sensitive not only to the computational linguistics of how we render things as, as characters, but also the social and cultural aspects of names and the collisions of cultures that we get as names move from one culture to another. So with that, I'll hand the mic. So what are some of the methods that we can use to match all the variability in names? One of them is a hashing plus rules method. Uh, this method is fast, but not accurate, and it's very brittle. If you have a single letter transposed in a name, uh, you're going to miss it using a hashing and rules method. If there are new names that um, come into your language or new nicknames, you're constantly going to be updating your hash table with these variations and these changes. Another method is called the common key method. Uh, again, the common key method is quite fast, uh, but it suffers a different problem from your hashing and rules method in that um, what it does is it assigns a key to similar sounding names and then compares those keys. And again, incredibly fast but low, pre low precision, you get a lot of false positives using a common key method. A third method is machine learning. Now, machine learning uh, solves the problem of uh, you know, a brittle approach where you constantly have to update. Um, and it also has excellent precision um, and accuracy. The issue with machine learning is that it tends to be slow. And also, it's, and, and not just in this particular case, but in a lot of cases, machine learning tends to be a black box where we don't understand why did I get what I got out of, out of this solution. So in order to achieve everything that we're looking for, which is speed plus precision, uh, we can take an ensemble approach. And we can use all of these various methods. We can use lists plus rules. We can use statistical approaches, um, the common key approach. And then using those three methods, we can limit um, the, the names that go to the uh, model, which is the, the higher precision, uh, method, but the slower method. And so by using all three of, or all four of these 
combined, we can get speed plus accuracy. So notice here, we're prompting a two-pass approach. Each of these methods have their advantages in precision and recall. We're to compose them in an intelligent way in one pass using the list rules and statistical, and then a separate using our uh, high quality name matching and scoring. More on that in a second. Uh, so another thing we wanted to talk about is where you actually encounter uh, high, volume, high volume query streams. Uh, so Chris gave one example in the beginning of the talk with Customs and Border Patrol. Another potential use case is in private industry where you have Fortune 500 companies that are performing market analysis. They might be pulling in data about competitors or their vendors or customers, um, doing various market and product research. They have massive amounts of data coming in where they need to uh, parse out names and uh, associate that with different business analytics. Another example is government intelligence. This one's probably pretty obvious, but uh, you have a lot of intelligence agencies, especially in this area, who are leveraging petabytes of data on a, on a daily and monthly basis, um, whether that's open source data or hard drives collected from the field, um, cable data, you know, there's huge volumes of data that's coming through these agencies, and they need to find um, who are the people in this data, match them with potential watch lists, put them in front of the analysts who need to see it. Uh, and it's also critical to know the names in your data for um, analyzing relationships between people, figuring out who bad actors are, who they're associating with, and things of that nature. Here I'll interject uh, an observation from the uh, recently departed technical director of the Skunk Works group at uh, one of our intelligence agencies. When talking about big data, what would you guess is his number one problem? How does he describe it from an intelligence consumer perspective? I'll give you a clue. His number two problem is analytics. Number one's right here on this slide, it's triage. Anytime you're dealing with these volumes, it's actually triage. You will not have time to do even high quality automated analysis of everything. You need a quick pass for triage, and here again is where names come to the fore. In almost any format of the big data that they're dealing with, there's likely to be a name, be it structured or unstructured. And then uh, another application is uh, KYC, know your customer. Uh, we actually have some clients who are running up to 40 million queries per hour. Um, Airbnb is not one of them, but they are one of our clients that we can talk about. And think about the problems that Airbnb has when they're trying to figure out a name. You have both um, users who could be potential vendors, they have apartments that they are renting out, as well as potential users. And as a user, um, they may be traveling all around the world and using different devices, whether it's a laptop or a phone, um, and accessing different forms. And those forms are not standardized um, across all those applications. So you get things like name order. Um, you get issues with transliteration across languages. If I'm in Japan, and I'm a Japanese citizen, and I go on to Airbnb, I log in um, using my Japanese name. If I travel to South America, um, if I also know Spanish, and I'm on the application there, and I'm getting the form that's been localized for South America, I'm entering in, again, potentially my name in a different language, and all that needs to be tied together uh, for a good user experience. When I pick up the phone and call Airbnb because I have an issue, I want them to know or they need to know where I've been, how I've been using their services, and whatnot. Um, so a, a, another application where name volume is and querying is, is at a massive level. Or to take this from the other side, I want help from them, but also if I'm renting a room, I don't want to get the same customer, the same renter, that they kicked out for trashing rooms. So as of counterterrorism, we, we have both sides 
of the precision and recall issue here, anytime you're dealing with a know your customer problem. And then we already spoke about border security, but anytime you have human beings crossing borders, getting on planes or trains, um, this is another time where you've got very high volume and you need uh, extremely fast responses. The, uh, the guys at TSA can't sit around and wait minutes, or, or even for that matter, seconds. Um, you really need sub-second level approach uh, to, to getting your response times and, and good accuracy in these types of applications. So in a second, we're going to talk about um, the actual querying method and what is happening um, and, and how that occurs. But before we step into that, I want to take a second and talk about the indexing of names and how we do that with Solar. Um, so the Rosette Name Indexer, or RNI, is a plugin for Solar. And one of the things it's going to do when you add a name into your um, index is it's actually going to break apart that name into 18 different keys. I won't go through every single one, but um, we will go through a couple examples. Um, one is it's going to look for an override file. And these are files like a nickname file, right? And if it finds an override for that particular name, it's going to add a key for that override. Um, another example is uh, a glued together key. So you can see here we had uh, Kim uh, Wonky was the name, and that went in all together as one name. This is going to assist with recall uh, at query time later. Um, and then another example is a, a double metaphone key. Uh, and an example of that, Kim, it's basically taking the vowels out and giving you the consonants back that make up that sound. So the double metaphone key, if you're not familiar with that, for Kim would be KM. Um, and again, all of this really helps when it comes to um, query time and uh, your scoring and accuracy. While we're on this, uh, let's go with a little bit into technical weeds. We've talked about fast, and this is the role of solar here. It's going to make use of these keys to be fast. But how fast is fast? How fast is a hash table based lookup? Any, algorithmically, Any, anybody? It's as fast as you can have, it's order one. And that's the key. We're using the fastest class of algorithm that exists for everything that we can possibly stuff in at this level for the first pass, which, and I'm going to start showing my cards now, is going to be aimed primarily at high recall. So again, to Chris's point, um, it's a two-pass system that will get us speed and accuracy for high query volumes. And the first pass is going to be that query um, against Solar's hash index using um, what we recommend is the square root size of your index. As an example, if you had a 150 million name index, the square root of that would be, who can tell me off the top of their head? No takers? 12,444.3. You can check me on that if anybody's got a calculator. Um, but regardless, that's that first recall, um, incredibly fast. And um, that list of names, those 12,000 names or so, roughly on our 150 million name index, will then be passed over to the rescore phase. That rescore phase is what I talked about earlier with that ensemble approach, where it's going to look for a perfect match using um, you know, a hash lookup. And if you have that, then no further processing is needed. Otherwise, it's going to move down another level to uh, the common key approach, and then to statistical. And then whatever names are left over that need to be analyzed um, using that AI model will then make it into that process. And so you're getting a combination there of speed and accuracy. Or to go back into algorithmic terms, we're doing essentially an order one lookup. Uh, there, there's some small uh, order n in the size of the result. But the n here, again, is the square root of our total num uh, number of records in our database against which we're searching. 
And now we're going to iterate over those anyway using our more expensive techniques uh, up to and including machine learning models. And in the rescore phase, I want to delve a little bit deeper into what's happening here. Um, so I talked about tokenization at index time. Uh, there's also tokenization that occurs during query time, where that name that we're querying um, will be tokenized, and you'll get an N by M matrix, where you're comparing the query name against um, the, the pairings that are available to it from that first phase. Um, and then the tokenized, the, the tokens will then um, be diagonalized according to the best algorithmic scoring fit. So in other words, we take the tokens in the query name, the tokens in one of those square root of n potential matches, and we're going to match them up all n by m, looking for the ones that correlate. The uh, individual name pair scores will then um, be generated. And following that, the uh, other fields that you have, such as you know, height, weight, date of birth, those other biographical fields that may be in your index, will be used uh, in combination with that name score to generate um, a final score. And then all those final scores are ranked from highest possible match to least likely match and return back uh, to the application. And then one of the things that we wanted to talk about is um, data profiling, right? So you kind of have an understanding of where we're coming from as, as far as speed and accuracy. Um, but one of the critical things in setting up this application to get you the accuracy that you need is understanding your data. A lot of people, when they think about name matching, don't even think about you know, profiling their own data to see what's in it. Um, as an example, you can look at name frequency. Um, does your name data have you know, 2 million last names of Jones out of you know, 100 million names? If so, when you see Jones, you probably want to give that a lower weight because it's so common. Um, other name phenomenon that you want to understand, something, say, like titles. If your um, search application is looking at, say, military uh, lists, titles might be incredibly important. Captain, corporal, lieutenant. Those might deserve a lot of weight. Um, if, if you're using a, a military application. Another one might be um, name order. Again, we kind of talked about Airbnb's use case where name order is not important to them because it's coming from so many different forms. They may have last name first, then comma, then middle name, then first name. Um, but there are other applications where you know every single time. I've, my names and my index are first name, middle name, last name. And when my queries come in, they're going to be first name, middle name, last name. If that's the case, then you want to change the weighting of um, name order and, and give it a higher weighting such that it's, uh, it plays a more important role in scoring names. Other configuration options are things like biographic data. Um, do you have height, weight, date of birth, um, gender? If you always have gender with your name data, and you know that, and you know that your searches will always have gender, and uh, your, your index will always have gender, that's an easy one, right? There's typically only two genders. Um, I say that cautiously, because today there might be more. <laughs> Tomorrow there, there could be even more. I'm not sure how that's going to play out. Um, I actually just filled out my air travel record for United. It did give me five options. <laughs> So yeah, we're so, definitely well over two. Yet another assumption that you, you tend to carry with a, a certain frame of experience that's not necessarily true in every culture, in every language, in every alphabet. Right. Um, and then another example might be date of birth. Um, is it consistent across your data and across your searches, in which case the, the order of date of birth, you should weight very high, or is it inconsistent? Do sometimes you have a four-digit year and then a two-digit day and a two-digit two digit, 
two-digit month. Say that 10 times fast. Um, so again, these are all parameters that you want to think about. You want to understand your data, take a hard look at it, um, and then configure how you score things appropriately. Earlier in the slide deck, we talked about uh, one of the weaknesses of artificial intelligence is that it's like a black box. And it's hard to understand what's coming out of it. Um, so one of the things that we've done is we actually developed a UI to try and make uh, the artificial intelligence explainable. And so what you're seeing is a screenshot where, and you, you can't see it here, but there were two names that were being compared that had a match score of 72%. And um, you're seeing how it was scored. Um, so in the... Uh, so uh, just to interject here, you recall we talked uh, about the N by M matrix. So in this case, we are searching on a Jesus uh, Diaz Lopez and our, uh, I'm sorry, that would more likely be the, uh, the database uh, representation. And we're searching on Alfonso Lopez Diaz with a rather naive spelling of Diaz by someone who doesn't know Spanish spelling rules, such as, for example, a, a German or uh, an English speaker might use. So this is exactly that diagonalization process where we are looking in this case, there, are no, there is no match for Al Alfonso, but at least the Lopez part uh, matches up, in this case, uh, identically. Why not 100%? Why, why not a score of 1.0 because Lopez matches? Anybody? How common is Lopez as a name? It's not that far off of Smith. It's not highly significant beyond that 0.787 that it match. And then in the case of Diaz and Diaz, uh, with this naive spelling, this is where the AI is coming in. In this case, a rather old AI technique, hidden Markov model. But the key here is that we're using this interface to, to explain why it came up. So that someone who sees this match maybe investigating the reason for a false positive or a false negative, knows why and can look at how they might, for example, want to tune their system. Perhaps in this particular data set, uh, Lopez actually is quite uncommon. And then one of the other features um, of this particular UI is the ability to um, configure different weights and then rerun those two names to see how that weighting changed and to see that explain statement and what happened there. Um, and you're just seeing a screenshot here. Um, this was some data that I had loaded into it where I had um, obviously the person name and then a company name and a location. There are a bunch of other fields there. If I could actually go in here, change the weighting, and then rerun that query and see how it affected the end result, and then also look at that explained statement and understand, okay, what was contributing to that final score and, and how did it change as I changed those weightings? Um, so again, just trying to open up that black box and make things more explainable and easy, easier to understand as to why you got the result that you got. And now I'd just like to open the floor for questions. Uh, the the uh, capability we've been talking about, it's called the Rosette Name Indexer. As they say, it's part of a stack of capabilities we have with text analytics. This one, though, is all about people, if by chance you deal with people. Yes, sir? Yeah, this is a key problem. The question was, given a uh, language that's famous for introducing uh, name recognition problems when forced into Latin alphabet, namely Korean, how do you handle, uh, the, the, I, I'm not sure what the most native one would be, but I'll, I'll just say it as G1. 
again, as with Muhammad, one way to spell it, it's in Korean, and it may be rendered not only with different spellings in English, but as different numbers of names. Is it all one name? Is it two names? Uh, two syllables, hopefully we're not going to make three out of it. This is another example actually combining several of the ones that I broke out as separate problems, but in, in this case, you have uh, uh, what we would call a token split, where it's one token in uh, two characters in Korean that may be split into a couple of three token, uh, three character tokens in Latin alphabet. And, we, we, and then, worse yet, it may be distributed across multiple fields. One may wind up in the middle name and one in the last name. So yes, the, these are exactly the problems that, that we're dealing with. And that diagonalization approach is where most of that happens, but there is some specific handling of uh, splits and concatenations. Uh, bottom line is, across the, uh, even across the scripts, we didn't give many examples, because if you use non-Latin script, most people in the room in the United States are not going to be able to read it. But we can match across, uh, you know, go back to Muhammad, since people tend to be most familiar with the spelling variations. We can match Muhammad from Arabic to the half dozen or so Latin script variations to phonetic renderings in Chinese, Korean, Japanese, et cetera. Yes? Uh, you brought up algorithmic complexity earlier with the algorithm. Yeah. Talk about the N by M matrix, not L1. Right. Uh, how, big is the, how big is that matrix talking about how you deal with that? Fortunately, in, in this case, we're only doing it pairwise. Now, the question was the n, n by m. Is this introducing th something worse than the order n, where here n is that square root of uh, the number in the database? Where we, we, in the hash table lookup, we pulled out from solar the top square root of n. Now we're going to do that. OK, let me keep my units the same. Square root of n times some m. Uh, is that changing our algorithmic order? And the answer is, in principle, it could. Fortunately, M is bounded. The worst example I know for uh, size of M would be those Tamil names, which wind up at about a dozen. Uh, if we ever start getting human beings, um, well, there's, there's uh, uh, Randall Monroe's famous example of uh, the uh, guy who's uh, the, the, the kid in uh, kindergarten whose name is, uh, quote, drop table students, semicolon. <laughs> uh, if we ever get people who have malicious names of several million uh, tokens, that could slow us down. Haven't run into that problem yet, fortunately. But with, with them being bounded by about a dozen, yeah, we're OK. Yes, sir? Right. We, yeah, um, I haven't seen IPA applied to this problem. Uh, we use consonant bigrams um, as one of our key uh, characteristics, those, those uh, high recall keys that we're producing, because consonants tend to be relatively well preserved across languages. Uh, I, the problem with IPA would be that it, 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 it expands things too much. Uh, what we're generally trying to do is kind of a meet in the middle approach between expanding the query and expanding the data. And I, I, it would, would be an interesting test, but I would say that IPA was designed for something, for those minor differences, you know, the uh, oh, it, it transliterated Chinese where you have an X and it can be of any of like five different consonants that I can't hear the difference between, or an Arabic soft and uh, hard S uh, that I can't hear either that's the sort of thing that collapses first across names, and we're actually not so interested in breaking out those differences. So I, I, I would say that's, that's probably the answer, but it would be an interesting technique to try. Um, quick anecdote, uh, we have a customer who has 20 billion names in their database. <laughs> I don't yet know why. We haven't gotten close enough to find out, but there's an anti-pattern behind there that somewhere where they have used name duplication to try to address a problem, name variation generation, and that actually aggravates the whole thing. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Right, right. So, 
as with any other characteristic of the person, we're going to have one or possibly more records in the database. Uh, one of the things I've learned about reasonably competent terrorists is they have uh, more than one birth date, for example. Uh, so all these assumptions you would have. Uh, but let, let's say that this, this person uh, is trans. We're going to have one gender in uh, a record in the database, and it's going to be a different gender when they show up uh, because they've changed. They've transitioned. So this comes down to a question of how you want to weight that. Ten years ago, I would have weighted gender pretty darn close to one. Today, I don't know what the number would be, and this, this would be perfect to have a test set you could run against and see what the right weighting is. But this is why the transparency of the algorithm and the ability to tune it is crucial, because I'm, I've been talking about changes in uh, a culture across, uh, yeah, naming culture across uh, geography, but there's a temporal change happening right now. Uh, time for one more question. One more. Uh, yes. yes, sir. So how would you handle this query that contains both name and other information? Because in our use cases, sometimes people type in the name with the company ticker with some other information like that. How would you identify the name? All right, the question is, what if it's not just a name? What if there's other context, uh, you know, perhaps a, a ticker? Or let me generalize that even more. Perhaps there's just some unstructured text around the name. And in fact, I'm going to make I'm going to ruin everything that Mike just did by saying the name is John Smith, spelled the normal way. Well, okay, I can match it. That doesn't help. But which John Smith is this? Okay, we have a ticker. If it's a small enough company, John Smith probably is unique at that company. Or we just have some plain lang a natural language text surrounding John Smith that establishes that John Smith is a pole vaulter. That's what we call resolution. Uh, we distinguish it as a complement to name matching, because name matching is one part of it. What if Smith is spelled a little bit wrong? But we're going to use that textual context, beginning with semantic vectors, but uh, using them, uh, compiling them in a way that they work cross language. So that, that would be a whole other talk as to how, yeah, how we go about this. But the bottom line is yes, absolutely. You've just picked the uh, inverse problem of what we've been working, and that's what we call resolution. And with that, I think I'm out of time. Happy to take any other questions. Uh, is, is there another call, talk right on the tail of this? Okay, well, uh, outside the room then. Thank you.